begin at verse 45. I'm going to talk to you this morning about the Holy Ghost. And I want you to think, when was the last time you heard a sermon on the Holy Ghost? And then ask yourself, how is it that we can forget about the most important gift that heaven has ever extended to us? I think sometimes that kind of represents uh, where Christians are today. We've got to be careful not to think that we can live successful Christians' life without the Holy Spirit. Not only have we not heard a lot of sermons about the Holy Ghost, but we hear little to none about speaking in tongues. Now, that scares some people right now. And yet, it is the most precious grace gift that heaven has ever extended to mankind. And once you understand how powerful it is, it will cause the devil to tremble because he now knows you know that you have one up on him. The Bible says in Luke chapter 10 and 19, he says, I've given you power over serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will by in any means hurt you. Turn to your neighbor and say, I have authority, I have authority. over all of the ability, of the, ability. Of, the of the devil. Think of that. Think of that. You have been given authority, which is the right to command, you know. Now, many people say, well, you know, God is in control. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in, in Genesis, God gave dominion and authority to mankind for at least 2,000 years. So everything that happens on this planet, you can't blame God for. You can't blame God for it because you, you can't go to God, Lord, why'd you let that happen? Because heaven is saying, why'd you let it happen? We gave, we gave the controls to you. How come you allowed it to happen? See, you have authority over the devil. You have authority over serpents and scorpions. You have authority over devils and demons. You have authority over earthquakes and hurricanes. You have authority over the wind and the rain, but you won't use it. And what happens in the life of a Christian who have, you, you know, even, even if you as an individual, you own a business and you give authority to a particular manager and he fails to use it, I mean, who are you going to blame? So right now, we have the authority and we need to let the devil know we know we have the authority. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of you will get it in a minute. You have been given the authority by the almighty God to act like little Jesuses on the earth. And Jesus came as a demonstration, as an, L, as an example of how a man should operate in that authority. Jesus came as a man anointed by God. There's nothing Jesus did that you can't do without that same anointing. But you keep letting the devil tell you you just a man. You were just a man until grace gave you the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then you went from being just a man to being a superman. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. I say you're a superman. I am here this morning to wake up a sleeping giant. You've been walking around with a sleeping giant on the inside of you. You've been walking around with the power to heal, the power to resurrect, the power to speak to storms and tell it to go the other way, the power to calm lives, to heal the sick. You have this authority and power, and you're walking around like some little old, some little old poor, broke, defeated Christian putting up with something that the devil has put in your way when you all of this time have had the authority to command what you need to command and watch the Holy Ghost help you out. But the deal is you've been trying to live this life without him. And you cannot live this supernatural life without the Holy Ghost. Amen? So now I'm giving you an opportunity to leave now before we get going. Because there may be some unusual manifestations here hit this dome. And if you don't want to encounter God, you might want to get on out of here. Because I came here expecting for the Holy Ghost to walk up and down every aisle. 
<laughs> hey, glory be to God. Hallelujah. I got to shake you out of your little, your little come to church, get a little word and go home and have some salad. I got to shake you up out of that, that little shama shama here and shama shama hair. I got to let you know that you have an unseen partner by the name of the Holy Ghost. I know the visitors are left. I thought you said that was a pretty calm church. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, the book of Acts chapter 10, we've been talking about, you know, what happened before Jesus went to the cross versus what happened after Jesus went to the cross. We were, we've been talking about the requirements before the cross versus the requirements after the cross. And what we've discovered so far is that the requirements before Jesus died and shed his blood were always based in what we can do first. If you obey first, if you do this first, then you enable God to do second. Well, Jesus changed the order after the cross, after he shed his blood, and it is no longer what you do first that enables God to do something, but it is now what Jesus has already done first that enables you to receive. Amen? Amen. And so we got into looking at prayer, how prayer has changed after the cross, and that now we pray to God based on what he's already done, versus praying to God in the old covenant before the cross, trying to get him to do something. Peter makes it very clear that everything that pertains to life and godliness has already been done. Everything that a man needs has already been done. Everything you'll ever pray for has already been done. Now think of that now. Your healing was provided 2,000 years ago. Your deliverance was provided 2,000 years ago. Your prosperity was provided 2,000 years ago. Everything you could ever need for this life was provided in Jesus and by him for you 2,000 years ago. And that's God's pattern. That's his MO. He didn't put Adam and Eve on the earth until everything was made ready. And then when everything was made ready, the last day when he finished everything, then God made man. But the same thing is true right now. Everything that we need in life, the thing you're, you're begging God to do, the thing you're praying and fasting for God to do, here's the news. He's already done it. What do you, what do you think he meant when he said on the cross, it is finished? He literally meant it's all done. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's finished. Your healing's finished, your deliverance is finished, your salvation is finished, whatever thing you'll need in life, it's already done. It's already done. It's a done deal. And it was provided to you by grace. It's a finished thing. So now, the Bible says that in Titus 2, 11 and 12, that the salvation has been made available to all men, that Jesus came to save the whole world. Now, what Jesus did, he did for every man on the planet, every good man, every bad man, every religious man, and every demon-possessed man. He did it for everyone. So salvation's been made available for everybody. But now, what's the difference between those who are saved and those who are not saved when he made it available for everybody? Well, those who are saved received it by faith. They responded to it and said, I'll take it. I receive it. Those who are not yet saved said, well, uh, I, I don't even know it's available to me and I hadn't responded to it and I hadn't taken it. And so they're still walking around in their own self-effort trying to accomplish something that Jesus has already accomplished. That's always the difference. He's done everything. But how you respond to it, how you decide to respond to it is going to determine whether or not you get a hold of it. Let's just say, for example, I, I want to use this as, as an illustration, Sister Marion, if you help me out. I make available, I make available today, I make, I make, I make available today a $100 bill. 
And I say, I say to Sister Mary, and I say, I say, I make available a hundred dollar bill today for you. Now, what she got to do? She got to respond. She, she got to respond. All right. And so far, we, we, I'm holding it, and she did. Come on, she got, she got to take it. She got to take it. See, it can be available to her the whole day, but if she doesn't respond, she never receives it into her possession. Well, that's what Jesus did. Jesus made everything available to you, but if you don't respond, and to, re to receive it means to take it. Salvation has been made available. Take it. Healing has been made available. Take it. Deliverance has been made available. Take it. Your promotion has already been made available. Take it. But as long as you're sitting around here talking about, well, praise the Lord, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Y'all getting what I'm saying? It's been, so it's always the response. It's always the response. How will you respond once you find out that Jesus did it all and finished it all? And it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Well, now, one of the ways to respond, of course, is what we just saw. She responded by faith and received what was made available. Another way to respond is by prayer. Prayer is a way that we can respond to what Jesus has already done. Prayer, prayer, if I had to come together with one description of what the purpose of it is for, the purpose for prayer under the new covenant is basically for intimacy and communion with the one who loves you and who has provided for you. Amen. I have to say that first. It is first and foremost to develop intimacy and communion with God. Why do I want to develop intimacy and communion with God? Because to know Him is to trust Him. Are you listening to me? To know Him is to trust Him. And when you know Him, you ain't got no problem trusting Him. When you know Him and you believe in Him and you know Him, then you, you, and you, listen, you know Him, you believe Him, you receive the love, you know He loves you. When you know God loves you, then you have no problems trusting what God will say to you. The problem will come is when you doubt His love, and you'll doubt His love because you don't know Him. So by spending time in prayer, you're spending time building intimacy. You're spending time building communion. It's the same way if you meet, if you meet some young lady or some young man and, and you're interested in them, you're going to have to commit commune together in order to develop some kind of relationship. You, you listen, you're not going to marry somebody you meet for the first time. At least I hope you don't. That might be the problem. You don't, you don't want to go to the mall and say, look at that. Will you marry me? Well, most likely she's going to like, I'm not going to marry. Why? I don't know you. I don't know you. And the same thing with God, you know, you know, you get saved. All right, Lord, will you heal me? Because you don't know him. Because when you know him, you'll find out he's already healed you. Will you deliver me? You ask that because you don't know him. When you go to God and you're like, God, you know, did you let this happen to me? And you're saying and doing those things because you don't know him. So prayer is foremost, first and foremost, the opportunity to commune and to develop intimacy with him and to have fellowship with him. Fellowship is an old English word. It comes from a Greek word, konania, which is a giving and a receiving relationship. It, 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 prayer can never be a monologue where you're doing all the talking. Prayer is a dialogue where you are speaking to him, watch this, and he is speaking to you. Hallelujah. It's a waste of time if you're just going to do all the talking. Amen. God wants to put some things on the inside of you. He wants to assure you of his love and his great grace that he has for you if we'll take the time to spend the time to develop that intimacy with him. So prayer, ladies and gentlemen, prayer is a communication system with God. Yes, it is. Prayer is, is literally pr saying to God what God has said in his word. Now, here's what religion told you. I oh, just go and talk to God any old kind of way. He just loves when you talk to him. Well, then, you know, I don't want you talking to me any old kind of way. So we have to learn how to communicate with him. You have to learn the system. You have to learn the prayer language. See, you can communicate with people who maybe understand a different language. Just because you're talking don't mean you're communicating. 
And so the prayer language is based in his word. Ephesians 6 says, put on the whole armor of God, which is the word of God, and take the word with you when you pray. So find out what the word has said and find out what the promises of God are and take it with you in prayer, especially under this new covenant of grace. Find out what he's already done and take it with you in prayer. And instead of going to prayer saying, God, heal me. Please, Lord, heal me. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, heal me. God's not going to answer that prayer. Why? Because he's already done that. Instead, we should go to God. Father, I thank you that I'm healed 2,000 years ago. Oh, I give you praise of what you did for me 2,000 years ago. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, that, that. God say, oh, yeah, oh, praise God. They believe that. That's how you pray. You don't, hit, you don't see that in, in, in the day's church. We're still begging God. We're still bowing down on our bending knees. Lord, if you stop by just a little while. See, God's not a visitor where he steps, stops by. He's committed to abide with you and to live with you and to never leave you nor forsake you. See, the two prayers, God's not going to answer that prayer because he's like, no, that's foolish. But we still pray those prayers because they're fancy, they're traditional, they make you feel good emotionally, but they, they, don't, they don't do nothing because it's not according to his way. You don't know him, and you keep proving that you don't know him when you pray. Oh, I can tell you, you get somebody up here and just tell them to pray, you find out if they know God or not. No, we got to find out what the Word says, and we got to pray the Word. Pray the Word. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, pray the Word. Pray the Word, and, and specifically pray the new covenant of grace. Pray what God has already done for you by His blood. Pray according to the new covenant that you live under. Don't pray according to a covenant that you no longer live under. You no longer live under the law of Moses. You're no longer under the law, but under grace. Romans 6, 14, you're not under the law. Sin shall not have dominion over you because you're no longer under the law. You're under the grace of God. So pray, pray according to the covenant of grace. Find out what it is. Now, see, all of a sudden, now it's important for you to come to church and sit under the word so you'll know what to pray, so you'll know what God has done for you, so that you, don't, you, don't be, you, you don't need to be trapped by religion and your religious past and, and your prayers don't get answered. You don't go praying, oh, God, you know, deliver me. You're already delivered. You were delivered the day he, he well, you delivered 2,000 years ago. It's now time for you to receive it. It's no different if, if you know, if I had a $100 bill in front of Sister Mary and she just kept saying to me, give me $100. Give me $100. Pastor, give me $100. Pastor, give me $100. I'm going to look at her like, what's wrong with you? Can't you see the $100? <laughs> we do the exact same thing with God every day. It's been made available. Now it's time for us to receive it. Now listen to this carefully. Every failure in life is a prayer failure. Every failure in life is a prayer failure. Every successful endeavor in life is because of successful prayer in life. Did you get that? Now, why would you say that? Why would you say every failure is a prayer failure? Listen to me carefully. I took time to look over the New Testament. I took time to look over the Gospels, and I noticed Jesus went from one place of prayer to another place of prayer, and in between worked miracles. I noticed Moses went from one bit of trouble to another bit of trouble. Every time they got stuck somewhere, he'd fall on his face and start praying and then something would happen. Nothing happens in the earth without somebody praying. Are you listening to me? Nothing happens in the earth without somebody praying. Prayer gives heaven permission to release the manifestations of what Jesus has already done. Mm -hmm. Somebody says, well, why would heaven need permission? Well, you, you're the people with the dominion and authority. You're the people with the dominion and authority. The Bible says whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. You've been given the power. You've been given the authority. So, when you pray, 
When you pray, God, I believe I received healing that you provided for me 2,000 years ago. God, I believe I received this unmerited favor that Jesus has made available to me right now. Then heaven has the permit to cause it to be or allow it to be manifested on earth. Now, I'm not praying so I can, out of self-effort, earn God's, you know, making God do something. He's already done it. He's already done it. But again, this is a way to, for me to respond to what's already done. Just like the $100 bill was already in her face, we, I still had to receive it. I still had to respond. And so I can receive it and respond in the place of prayer. Heaven is waiting on permission to cause what grace has made available to be manifested in your life. Amen. And that may explain why a lot of people who understand that Jesus has already done it but they are living a prayerless life and not responding to what Jesus has already made available. It is finished, all right? You have the authority, so pray and receive it. Now, I'm not talking about you spending nine hours praying. Jesus even spoke against long prayers. Amen. Isn't that good? It's good Jesus spoke against long praying. You remember going to some of them churches and they pray so long, you figure, dear God, do you have that much to say to the Lord? <laughs> and most of the time it was, you know, using all those words to fix stuff up. My dear, kind, most awesome, omniscient, <laughs> wonderful, powerful, mighty God. When they could have just said, dear God. Kind of like when, it's kind of like when a soul sister singing the national anthem, you think that's going to take a long time. <laughs> oh, say, hey, 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 you, uh, uh, B. You're like, God, dog, this going to take at least 25 minutes. <laughs> and God, and God said, be careful when you find people that pray like that. He says, most of the time, they're hypocrites. So I'm going to call some of y'all up to pray next week and see if you've got this. <laughs> now, in your own prayer time, you do what you want to do. In your own prayer time, but Jesus warned those who pray long prayers in front of people, they have their reward. Okay? Now, I believe with all of my heart that when I fail to pray, I fail to give the permit heaven needs for the manifestation to be seen in my life. So all of a sudden, Prayer is a very vital part of my life. When I first started in ministry, that's all I was sure of. I didn't know how to do nothing, except I knew if I would pray and obey what God told me to do in prayer, everything would be all right. I didn't know how to do nothing. In fact, every time they asked me, well, how'd you do that? How'd you do that? I said, well, we prayed. We just believed God. All right? So I believe after all, all that time that this is, this dome is a physical manifestation of prayer. Of us giving permit for it to be built physically here on the earth. Amen. Amen. Now, let's begin something because God has given us a gift to help us to pray above our natural ability to pray. And I want to see if I can change your mind today about the Holy Ghost and about speaking in tongues, if you'll understand what it is about, all right? Now, you in Acts yet, chapter 10? <laughs> Dear God, that's a... All right, verse 45. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Ghost. Somebody, somebody shout, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is a gift. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? When something is a gift, can you do something to earn it? Can you work for it? If you could work for it, it wouldn't be a gift, would it? 
If you could deserve it, it wouldn't be a gift, right? So, so, so obviously, God loved us so much, He looked at our lives and He says, I'm going to give them a gift. And He says that the gift is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the gift. Now look at the next verse, verse 46. He says, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God and then, and then answer Peter. Now this is a whole story about Cornelius and um, how uh, he prayed and, 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 and Peter was, you know, God told him to go and minister to him and they thought that the Holy Ghost was only going to be for the Jewish people, and he found out it was for Gentiles as well, okay? Now, the Holy Ghost is the gift. The Holy Ghost is the gift. Now, go to Ephesians chapter 2 and 8 real quick. The Holy Ghost is the gift. All right, Ephesians 2 and 8. Say that one more time. I want you to get that. The Holy Ghost is the gift. The Holy Ghost is the gift. Now, notice this. For by grace are you saved, delivered from evil, all those things. By, by grace you're saved through what? Faith. All right, you were saved how? By grace. By what? Grace. You got it. So grace provided salvation, but you received it And it is the gift of God. So how do you receive gifts from God? By faith. It was provided by grace, but you receive it how? So is the Holy Ghost a gift? Now how are you going to receive him? By faith. So say out loud, I receive the gift of the Holy Ghost by faith. It came to me through grace. So when each of you were born again, somebody says, well, when did I receive it? You received it the day you got born again. You received it the day you got born again. You received the Holy Ghost the day you got born again. You received it the day you got born again. Somebody said, well, what about Tom? So, so, because it's been said that if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Holy Ghost. No, 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 no. You have the Holy Ghost by faith. Speaking in tongues is just you yielding your tongue to the Holy Ghost. You, you see, see, the Holy Ghost comes in, and now you've got to yield yourself to the Holy Ghost. You have to yield your hands. When you yield your hands to the Holy Ghost, you can heal. When you yield your feet to the Holy Ghost, God can lead you. And when you yield your tongue to the Holy Ghost, He can provide words for you. But it's not speaking in tongues that gets you the Holy Ghost. It's the gift of the Holy Ghost that when you yield to him, he will now begin to influence every part of your life. Yes. Does everybody understand that? Yes. Now, the reason why I mention that, because we grew up with the phrase, you got to tarry for the Holy Ghost. That's, that's, that's not under the grace of God. You know, you know what I mean, tarry. The word, the word literally means to wait. But there was in those times, my, my, uh, my, my aunt, Jim, Aunt Jimmy, was, uh, she was a Church of God in Christ preacher, still is, still alive, all 90-something, I believe. And uh, boy, they, they believed you had to tarry for the Holy Ghost. And they bring you to the altar and you had to cheese, 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 you spit and whatever, but you don't leave until you get it. Cheese, 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 cheese. And then if you don't get it real quick, they figure, oh, they got sin in them. Come on, we need to wash them. Pour oil on them. Cheese, 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 cheese. And then you got you, your head looking all greasy up. Cheese, 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 cheese. You stayed all night tearing for the Holy Ghost. And I figured what happened was you got so tired, you're just like, whatever. Oh, oh, what happened? They got it. They got it. Now they were tired. They were just delirious. You know? <laughs> Didn't know no better. Did what you knew to do at the time. Are you listening to me? But you get the Holy Ghost the day you get saved. It's a part of the salvation package. Salvation was a gift. Faith was a gift, grace was a gift, and the Holy Ghost is a gift. I don't see you deserving nothing or working for nothing or earning for nothing. I see Jesus giving you everything you need. Amen? All right, now, John 16, 23. Is everybody with me on this journey? Oh, this is going to be a good journey. Hallelujah. You're going to feel most powerful when you walk out of here today. You're going to walk out of here with your, with, your, with your head up knowing, oh, devil, all this time you've made me think that you were in control. 
I tell you what, I, I'm finna go home. By the time I get home, I'm gonna open up a can of whoop on you. You better not be there when I get there now. You, you're getting out of my marriage, you're getting away from my children, you're getting off my money, you're getting off my job. You don't have authority over me, I have authority over you. In fact, there are two words power in Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power. That's translated authority. So that you can have power over the power of the devil. Now that's translated ability. And what he says is, is you have authority over all of the ability of the devil and nothing will be able to hurt you. So every time the devil comes up with his ability to try to do something, take authority over his ability. Take authority over his ability. Don't sit there and tell me that's the devil. Now, if you see the devil, take authority over his ability. The devil is afraid of everybody that look like Jesus. And I'm telling you, with the armor on, he's not quite sure who under it. He don't know if you're the real deal or an offspring. Whew. All right, verse 23. Now, Jesus is talking. He's getting ready to leave his disciples. And in John, he's getting ready to talk about what's going to happen after the cross. And in that day, that day being that day after he sheds his blood, in that day you shall ask me nothing. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, what did he say? <laughs> so the name of Jesus is your authority to get prayer answered. Now, I don't know how you're going to forget this. He said, whatsoever you ask the Father in the name of Jesus, the Father will do it. I dare you to go home and ask the Father in the name of Jesus. All right, now look at verse 24. Hitherto, right up to this point, you've, you've asked me nothing in my name. He says, before the cross, you ain't asked me nothing in the name of Jesus. <sighs> Hitherto have you asked nothing in, in, in my name. Ask, and you shall receive. Uh oh, that got rid of that one prayer talking about God has three answers to prayer. Yes, no, and not now. God ain't got, God ain't got but one answer to prayer. Yes and amen. If you praying like he told you to pray, yes and amen. He says, I'm going to answer so your joy may be full. Verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. 26. At that day, you shall ask in my name. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that day is this day. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. In that day, you shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you I, that I will pray the Father for you. He says, you're going to ask in my name, and I'm going, I will make sure you get it. I will pray the Father for you. Now, that's already powerful, right? You can ask in the name of Jesus, and Jesus says, I will, he says, I'll tell you the truth. I'll pray the Father for you. So now you wonder what's going on in your life. The first thing you need to do is pause and say, did I ask in the name of Jesus or have I been sitting around waiting on grace to fall on me? Yeah. Are you listening to me? Yeah. I, yeah, people may disagree with this, but I don't, I, I, here's what I, I just don't believe that <laughs> nothing just happens. Mm -hmm. Nothing just happens. I believe how we respond to a thing in faith is how it's able to manifest in our lives. I believe that. Now, I'm not trying to make God do something. He's already done it. But receiving it is what we've got to learn how to do. Now, let's get on into it now. So why the Holy Ghost? Why do I need to even think about receiving the Holy Ghost? You've seen how powerful prayer is just in the name of Jesus. You know the authority that you have just in the name of Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and tell them to wake up because the devil's going to try to put you to sleep. Wake up. Should have went to bed last night. Wake up. I'm getting ready to tell you something that's getting ready to change your life, change your business, change your marriage. Wake yourself up. Wake up. Pinch yourself. Have somebody to slap you if they see you fall asleep. Wake up.
I'm explaining these scriptures. Some of y'all sitting there like. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 14. Ooh, somebody say, you excited? That's because I'm 19. <laughs> Glory to God. First Corinthians chapter 14, too. Now, watch some news person talk. Pastor Dollar, 19. <laughs> yeah, report that. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm working on 120. Praise God. And I don't want to look like 120. I just want to just be 19. <laughs> Men tapping, 19, playing cops and robbers with no kids in the house. Praise <laughs> God. Somebody said, what's cops and robbers? Ask your mama when you get home. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's probably how you got here. Praise God. <laughs> All right, let's get back in the spirit. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 14 to 2. <laughs> All right, now watch this. Now here we go. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. How can they? How be it? In the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. So the first thing we see is that there is a Bible mention of people speaking in tongues. Because men in the past hadn't understood it. They, they then section it up and said, some people can have and some people can't. No, no, that ain't what he said. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue. Now, in your, amp, in your King James Bible, the word unknown is in italicized, which means it was added by the privilege of the translators to try to amplify the meaning once they translated it from its original language to this English language. Unknown doesn't mean it's unknown to any, everybody. It just be, it may be unknown to the people who don't know the language. See, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost came, they began to speak in tongues, and others heard their language being spoken by people in that upper room that didn't know it. So it may be unknown to you, but it's not unknown. Years ago in the chapel, we had a man that came to our church, and I was speaking to the congregation in tongues, and I followed up with an interpretation of what was said. That's called the gift of tongues. And when I did that, there was a man standing by my mother. She was ushering in those days back then, and, and the man, you know, didn't, wasn't seated because he had just come in. And he, he reached over to mama. He said, he said, I didn't know your son spoke that language. He, she said, well, I don't, I don't think he knows I speak nothing but English. Uh, she said, he said, no, ma'am, he, he spoke that, he speak, he speak my language, I speak that language, and he gave a perfect interpretation of it. Well, now, she's sitting there, well, well, praise the Lord, must have been the Holy Ghost, because as far as I know, he only know how to speak English. Well, now, that's what it was. I'm speaking in a tongue that was unknown to me, unknown to my mama, but somebody somewhere knew it. Are you understand what I'm saying? For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh unto men. Now, we used to pray to God in tongues, and because people, some didn't understand it, they would come visiting, and then they go to rebuking everybody, saying, you out of order, you out of order, you're not supposed to speak in tongues without an interpretation. No, that's only when you're talking to men. I ain't talking to a man, I'm talking to God. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now look at this in the, in the Amplified Bible. Now, <clears throat> speaking in tongues, the first thing I want to establish, all right, now when you're speaking in tongues, he just said you don't understand what you're speaking, but is it a way for you to understand what you're speaking? Now that sounds strange. He said you don't understand what you are articulating, but do you know what you are saying? Well, let's settle that now. He says in the Amplified, for one who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men but to God, for no one understands or catches his meaning. Because in the Holy Ghost, he utters secret truths and hidden things not obvious to the understanding. So I don't know exactly what I'm saying, but I know what I'm saying. 
What am I saying? Secret truths and hidden things that are not obvious to my understanding. See, there may be things going on in your life that, that you just don't know what it is. It's just not obvious to you what the issue is. It's not obvious to you what the problem is. Maybe there's a situation in your marriage and you're doing all you know to do and you're just not, it's just not obvious what the issue is or, or obvious how to resolve it or something in business might be going on or something going on with your money and it's just not obvious to you. But what he says is when you speak in tongues, you will speak secret truths and hidden things that are not obvious to your understanding or to your mind. Now think of that. Now I can't tell you what I said, but I know what I said was a secret truth, a hidden thing that wasn't obvious to my understanding. What could you do with an understanding of what you didn't understand? What could you do if you could release something, glory to God, by faith concerning something that's not obvious to you at the time? I don't even know why that person don't like me. It's not obvious to you at the time. And then you get to praying in tongues and secret truths and hidden things show up. So you understand what I'm saying? Now look at verse 14. Verse 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, man is a what? Spirit being. He possesses a what? Soul. He lives in a what? Physical body. So what part of man is praying when a man speaks in tongues? Spirit. His what? Spirit. Now, what part of man, what part of the tripart man is perfect? Spirit. It's spirit. What part of the tripart man did God move in? Spirit. So I would submit to you, spirit, soul, and body, that the perfect part of you is your spirit man. Huh? And the part that God lives in is your spirit man. So when you're praying in tongues, oh, your spirit now is praying. So that's a perfect prayer. See, I might not know how to pray a perfect prayer in English with all the knowledge I have of prayer, but when I speak in tongues, my spirit man is praying a perfect prayer about every situation with hidden truths and secret things not obvious to my mind. So I'm going to read it like this. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth secret truths and hidden things not obvious to my mind because my understanding is unfruitful. And that's a gift. All right, now watch this. Everybody with me? Let's look at the origin of tongues. Let's look at the beginnings of it when it showed up on the earth. Go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. There's some people in here who've been saved. They ain't never heard a sermon on the Holy Ghost. And they're sitting here like, dear God, I didn't know this existed. You will today. Dear God, there are demons in your neighborhood packing up because of what you're learning today. What the world you think going to happen when you start praying perfect prayers? He says, I gave you the Holy Ghost so he can help you to pray a perfect prayer. Acts 1 and 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you should be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. I'm going to give you power to be a witness. All right, I'm going to be, you're going to receive power. When will you receive power? After the Holy Ghost has come. So that, 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 that appears to be saying that the Holy Ghost is the prerequisite to power. And once you have the Holy Ghost, you have what? Once you have the Holy Ghost, you have what? All right, what kind of power? Because in church, people said we had power, but I didn't know what they were talking about. What kind of power? What, Superman power, Batman power? What kind of power? What kind of power you got? 
What kind of power you got? I, mean, I got the Holy Ghost. I got power. What, what kind of power? What, you, what kind of power? You got your cell phones in your computer? Get, get your dictionary out and look up the word power with me right now. This, this is a 26, 2015 generation. Get your phone out. You know you got it. Looking at it, texting. Get it. Get it out. Get your dictionary out and look at the word power because it's got we to we we get it right here. You got to know what he's talking about when he's, what is it should you, what should you be expecting and looking at as a result of the Holy Ghost in your life? Power. What kind of power? What kind of power? Somebody said, dunamis power. No, no, I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about what is power? See, if you don't know what power is and you just uh, assume that it is this, I mean, what do I have? Do I have power to, 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 to jump builders in a single bounce? Do I have power to, 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 to bend iron? Do, what do I have power? What is the power that I have? What's the power? What's the power? Can I raise the dead? What is the power? You have, well, what's the ability? What's the ability? I'm glad you said that. What's the ability? It's still, you got to find out what it is. Okay, so you got your phones out. So what is power? How do we define power? An ability to get results or to accomplish. What else you see in there? Ability to get results, to accomplish. What else you see? Huh? Capability, capability. Now you're capable with ability. Competence. Strength. I'm trying to give y'all opportunity to be techie today. <laughs> Say that again. The ability to cause or to prevent an action. Ah, that's good right there. <laughs> I, I felt that. The ability to cause. God, to me, that. The ability. Somebody said, what you just said? I, I don't know, but it was, it was a hidden truth and a secret thing that wasn't obvious to my mind. He's trying to, he's trying to, he, I, the word wasn't obvious that I needed to say next in this sermon, so I said, Calabras, and he's going to help me out to say what i been blown away, you know? The ability to cause or to prevent an action. To cause or to prevent? Don't that sound like to bind or to loose? The ability to do that. And that comes after the Holy Ghost. So to receive this gift means you're going to receive an ability to cause or to prevent an action. God, dog, I got to sit down a little bit first. Whoa! Now, how does he plan on using the gift of the Holy Ghost to give us an ability to cause or to prevent an action? Go to, go to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Whew. Oh, Lord. World changes, church getting ready to turn on some supernatural. You're going to walk out of here with an, with an understanding of your ability to cause or to prevent an action. Man, I got to give you some money for that one right there. What were you talking about, boy? The cause or prevent an action. Pastor, you getting money away today? All right, now you there, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. Now, it's one thing to have wind on the outside, but now if you got wind in your house, you might need to go check the doors and the windows. Amen. <laughs> Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Holy Ghost said to me last night, he said, this is important. Get it, get it. I'm like, I don't see it, Lord. He said, get it, get it. He said, the Holy Ghost came upon everybody that was at rest. 
So that lets you know when you are at stress, you're hindering what the Holy Ghost can do in your life. You got to learn how to rest, trusting in the Holy Ghost. Verse 3, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire. So it looked like fire. And it sat upon each of them. Now, not, not, not cloven tongues is not talking about human tongues flapping around over people's heads. No, he's talking about fire. The tongue of fire went in a fireplace, talking about fire. And it sat upon each of them. So imagine fire coming and sitting upon everybody's head. Fire. Look at verse 4. And they were all filled with, here's the gift, what? And when the Holy Ghost came, they began to do what? Speak. speak with some other tongues other than the one they had. Speak with another language other than the one they were articulating. And they were speaking it how? As the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, gave them the utterance or the words. So the Holy Ghost now was giving them the words because they couldn't get it from their mind because the mind hadn't been trained to speak that language, which is why the spirit had to speak because the mind wasn't capable of telling the mouth what to say. But the Holy Ghost in your born again spirit began to give utterance to your spirit, which translated out of your mind out of your mouth, and that's why you can't speak in tongues out of your mind because your mind hadn't been trained in that language, but the perfect part of you can receive utterance from the Holy Ghost to rematokros nana blakasa. Now, I didn't get that from my mind, but I've been doing it so long that I have faith in the Holy Ghost to give me the utterance to speak in tongues out of my spirit. Yes. Are you following me? Yeah. Now, so what are you saying? So what's the deal? All right, I got the Holy Ghost. He gives me the other than speaking tongues. Why should I want the gift? Go to Jude. The book of Jude, right before Revelation. Jude, verse 20 and 21. Expression of confidence. Jude 20, 21. We're almost there now. Verse 20. Read verse 20 out loud with me, ready to read. But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying. Okay, what do you call it when somebody's praying in the Holy Ghost? They are speaking. He, look at the Amplifier right quick. This is amazing. He, when he says building yourself up, he's talking about your life is going to be like an edifice. You know, an edifice goes higher and higher. And the Amplifier says this. He says, but you, beloved, build yourselves up, founded on your most holy faith. Make progress. How many of y'all Christians want to make some progress? Yeah. He is saying that the Holy Ghost and you speaking in tongues is designed to help you make progress. And if there's anything I know we need to do as Christians today is make progress. See, like everybody in the world making progress except church folk. After 20 years, church folks still stuck in the past, doing the same thing, wearing the same thing, acting the same way, because they ain't made no progress. But praying in the Holy Ghost will help you to make progress, and you will rise like an edifice, higher and higher. How? By praying in tongues. Now, here's the issue here. Go back to the King James. Here's the issue. I wouldn't have had no problems if the Bible said, build yourself up by praying in your faith. But when he said, praying in your most holy faith, now there's a clear distinction between faith and most holy faith. Right. Faith 
is a practical expression of your confidence in God and his word. It's a practical expression of your confidence in God and his word. And it is a practical expression, expression of your confidence in God and in the word that you can understand. Most holy faith is a practical expression of your confidence in God and in his word that you don't understand. Now, what is that? Why is it most holy faith when you pray in tongues? Because you are praying about something you don't know about, and that faith cannot be tainted or infected with doubt, because how are you going to doubt what you don't know? Uh-huh. How are you going to doubt the words that you spoke or prayed and you don't even know what you spoke or prayed? You just know it was a secret truth and a hidden thing that wasn't obvious to your mind. So it's impossible for you to doubt it. See, in, in English prayer, you might say, oh, Lord, I, I, I pray for healing. And then you come out and, and then you have these little thoughts. Oh, well, I don't know. Oh, well, where the pain come? And then all the little attacks and the doubts. So you're fighting through with that. But he said, with, with, with the Holy Ghost and praying like this, you ain't going to be able to doubt what you pray because you don't have an understanding of what you just prayed. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Are y'all getting this? Yeah. So how, see, it's one thing for me to say, oh, Lord, I thank you that I have a promotion. And then you look for it every day and look for it and stuff go on. But now when you say, and you say, Lord, I believe I received that in the name of Jesus. And you just walk away and you don't forgot about it. You believed you received it. You ain't going back three or four times. You just believed it. You received it. And then one day this thing manifests in your life and you're trying to figure out where did that come from? That must have been the day I prayed in the Holy Ghost and released my faith for something I didn't even know about. Oh, oh, oh. Is that possible? Well, go to Romans chapter 8 and 26. We're almost there. Romans 8, 26. Romans 8, 26. Oh, somebody finna pick this thing back up again. The first thing you're going to start noticing when you start back praying in tongues is a peace that passes all understanding. There's going to be an ease entering into your life and a confidence that it's all well. Romans 8, 26. Is this possible? Does the scripture say what you just explained? Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, also helpeth our infirmities. Now, an infirmity is a weakness of the flesh, a weakness of the flesh. Specifically now, what is the weakness that he's referring to here? Because he has a colon here, which is going to be followed by a definition. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. What infirmity? For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So the weakness is, how can I pray for something I don't know about? How can I pray for something that's going on and I don't know what's going on? He says, but the Holy Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit's not a it, it's him. The Holy Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered in articulate speech. He is literally saying, you now have an ability when you pray in tongues to pray about stuff you don't even know about. There was a situation here. A lady was, uh, had a son, and her son was, I think, was early grades. He was riding the bus home. He got off the bus, and around that same time, she started, she was home washing the dishes and started praying in the Holy Ghost, started praying in tongues. Now, she didn't know what she was praying about. She just was moved to pray in tongues. She's praying. Now, meanwhile, 
At that same time, her little boy was getting ready to cross the street, and there was a car that passed the bus sign, and he was about to walk out and, and would, would have gotten hit by that car and done, without a doubt killed. But for some strange reason, he tripped and fell backwards. Well, when they came home and explained to the mom that, you know, we wanted to just tell you what almost happened, but thank God it didn't happen. She said, well, when was this? And, and, and they said about the time when she was praying. She says, I was praying that very moment. What was happening? The Holy Ghost helped her to pray about what she didn't even know about. And her son came home. I don't know about you, but I will not presume, presume to have the ability to pray about everything in, in, in English because I don't know everything that's going on. And you don't know everything that's going on. You might be getting ready to go into business with somebody that they got the game right. They look right. They act right. They're saying all the right things. But the Holy Ghost is saying you need to pray. You need to pray. And you pray in the Holy Ghost, and all of a sudden God stops you from getting into something that's getting ready to mess your whole life up. That same thing with marriage. You look at her, you love her, she love you. You come to counseling session, I say, y'all had an argument yet? No, we don't never have an argument. Well, you ain't ready to, you ain't ready to get married if you ain't had no argument. Because you need to know how that joker going to respond when he look kind of angry. I mean, do, do he throw things? Or do, he, do he levitate? What, what do he do when he, you need to see? You ain't ready to get married? Well, now we, we've never had a fight as long as we've known each other. Well, you ain't ready, because when you get married, you're going to have, you're going to have some bouts, two, three thousand of them, you're going to have some bouts. Is he forgiving? Does he express himself by throwing stuff? You need to know that. But you pray in the Holy Ghost, and it will help you to pray about what you don't know about. There are lots of things we don't know about, yeah. both good and bad. He'll have you to pray about things you don't know about and cause the situation to show up to you. Or you'll pray about things you don't know about and prevent a situation from happening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maybe there was supposed to be a plane crash, but you prayed in tongues. And that little screw that was getting ready to come out of that part of the engine had to hold itself until you landed. Oh, y'all understand what I'm saying now? You understand what I'm saying? I am here today live because we prayed in the Holy Ghost and it helped to prevent our death. I didn't know it was going to happen, but Jesus knew it was going to happen. And when he shows up and say, pray in tongues, don't talk about you sleep. You turn yourself over, stand up in that bed, do what you got to do. It ain't going to take many, but you reba so kakalaba si lebata laba sa. And you don't stop until you led to stop. Because somebody's life might be on the line. And not only somebody's life on the line, there may be something awesome getting ready to break through for you if you can pray it on through. Because the Holy Ghost is there to prevent and to cause. He is your cause and effect. But we forgot about it. We forgot about the Holy Ghost. We don't say good morning, Holy Ghost. We don't talk to no Holy Ghost. We don't pray in the Holy Ghost because we thought we got too smart. We thought in this generation, nobody speaks in tongues. That's for stupid people. Well, I'm stupid then because I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to be stupid healthy, stupid rich. Stu I, I'm not, I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost. I don't care. They can accuse me. They can accuse me of not being intelligent because I pray in the Holy Ghost. I bet you I done took care of something you didn't know about. I bet you I just took care of something that I didn't know about. I need the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in uh Oh, one of them scriptures. Ephesians somewhere. <laughs> somewhere in how I do it. Somewhere in the Bible. It says, praying always with all prayer in the Spirit. Yes. Paul said, 
The Apostle Paul says, I pray in tongues more than you all. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians 14 says, when you pray in tongues, you give God perfect thanks. Mm -hmm. I have this dream that every member and every partner and every church is now going to start spending time praying in their most holy faith. And I got this dream that I'm going to look out and see you making progress in your life. And all of a sudden, you ain't stuck no more. All of a sudden, you're not in a ditch no more. All of a sudden, the prayers in tongues have caused things to happen and prevented things to happen, and you're living long, prosperous lives, and you're happy, and you're full of joy, and when we come to church, the Holy Spirit is there meeting us, all because we've decided to trust this grace gift, to trust this gift of the Holy Ghost, and to believe that He will lead us, and He will guide us, and He will talk to us, and He will take care of us. It is a gift that God sent. Jesus said, since I can't be with y'all no more, I'm going to send you another comforter, and he will lead and guide you into all the truth. I need the Holy Ghost. I said, I need the Holy Ghost. I need him to help me, help me to pray. I, I need him to, to help, help me to preach. I, I need him to, to help me to be the husband I need to be. I need him to help me to be the father I need to be. I cannot do this by myself. But thank God we don't have to do it by ourselves. He has sent us the gift of the Holy Ghost. He is your unseen partner. He is the one that will move in places you don't know how to move in. And you got to trust your unseen partner. The Bible calls him a helper, and he is the very present help in a time of trouble. That when things go on and you just, you just, Holy Ghost, and he already got your back. He already got your back. Something about when you're praying in tongues, it even changes your biological makeup. Things that have been released in your body to destroy you are under attack by the resources of the Holy Spirit. Woo, Jesus. I dare you to receive a diagnosis from the doctor and then start praying in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. He'll lead you to start drinking more water. He'll lead you to the right supplement. He'll lead you to the right eating habit. He'll lead you. He'll lead you. He will lead you. He will lead you. He will lead you. He will lead you. But you got to trust him. You got to trust him. Got to trust him. Hallelujah. So you wonder how we're going to make it the rest of the way? Holy Ghost. Crises are coming. We're not going to participate. We're not going to participate in none of the crises. We're going to walk in by faith and not by sight. Well, you know, Brother Dollar, they're going to, the money's going to be in an attack. No, you're going to be all right. God takes care of you. A lot of stuff ain't going to happen because you're still here. And honey, let me tell you something. If you're praying for a raise, if God got to give everybody in the company a raise in order to get you yours, he knows how to do it. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to be without trouble, but I'm saying you got some help when trouble show up. The Bible says, they that live godly shall suffer persecution. So go on, suffer your persecution, and drive to the bank and roll the window down and make another deposit. Because you trust God. Everything going to be all right. If you didn't get the car, God got a better one for you. If they turned you down from the house, he got a bigger one for you. Hallelujah. If you got fired from your job, he's trying to show you that you're an entrepreneur and he wants you to make it more than whatever.